last speaker of today, uh, before we have a break and the panel, is Steve Horvath from UCLA, who uh, I guess will probably talk about epigenetic uh, clocks. Uh, Steve, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I hope you like my display settings. Um, does that look good? Can you see it? Looks great. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so I will talk about epigenetic clocks. They've been mentioned by others. Um, we use methylation to um, um, not only estimate chronologic age, but importantly, also mortality risk. So I want to emphasize that right away. Um, I'll start with um, studies in mice. Um, um, I uh, collected over 2,000 mouse tissue samples. They are all being measured on a new array platform called the mammalian methylation array. This array is applicable to all mammals. And here I just want to show you a, a completely independent analysis of our mouse clocks. So these are strictly test data. Um, different brain regions, striatum, cortex, cerebellum, um, liver, uh, also tail. Uh, interestingly, tail samples work beautifully. I should mention ear samples work beautifully. I don't know how many sources of DNA I looked at, maybe 20 different uh, cell types from mice. So the clocks work quite well. This particular data set comes from a Huntington disease study. And um, in my worldview, Huntington disease um, sometimes exhibits accelerated epigenetic aging. We have a couple of papers out in humans, but here we kind of um, replicate this finding um, in um, uh, cerebellar samples from a mouse model of Huntington disease. So you may appreciate here there's a slight increase in the epigenetic age um, of Huntington disease the mice, these so-called Q175 mice. But I would say the effect of um, Huntington disease is weak, you know, so um, the one genotype everybody knows are growth hormone receptor knockouts, right? And these dwarf mice live substantially longer lives. And sure enough, all of my epigenetic clocks indicate that these um, knockout mice slow according to epigenetic clocks. And here the plot shows you in black control mice. St in Steve, red, uh, sorry to interrupt you. We have, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yes. We have uh, your slides are not coming through really very well, so I'm wondering if uh, um, does, if you can try better? to restart the. Can you try to restart the the present the um, the PowerPoint maybe? What happens if okay. you restart it? Okay. I apologize. Yeah, for interrupting no you. Can, can you see this better? Mm -hmm. We can see this. Yeah. If you try to run the, just keep the the zoom at a hundred percent, and then maybe start the slideshow. Let me put it this way: if you see the slides now, let me just proceed. You know, it's too risky. <laughs> so um, the the red dots are the knockout mice, and you appreciate that in the um, cortex, hippocampus, kidney, liver. Um, these um, knockout mice show slower epigenetic age, which is on the y-axis, you know. So um, there's another gold standard anti-aging intervention, caloric restriction. And I can tell you that finding is utterly robust, you know. So any mouse clock I have that I apply to these kinds of data um, of caloric restriction show slower epigenetic aging in the liver. Um, I, I have three or four of these types of experiments and very consistent findings in mice. The other gold standard intervention um, all of us care about is rapamycin. And um, unfortunately, I see a weaker effect than 
that observed for caloric uh, for growth hormone knockouts or caloric restriction. So here I show you some uh, mouse studies from Rich Miller and Vadim Gladyshev. And what we find is, so yes, for example, rapamycin is associated with slightly slower aging in the liver, p-value 0.03. Um, this may be a sample size issue. We only had six mice that were treated with rapamycin, you know. But um, at the same time in the left panel, you see the results of caloric restriction. We get a p-value that is an order of magnitude more significant. So I would say rapamycin has a, a weaker effect on epigenetic aging. I now want to turn to other mammals. So again, um, our mammalian array really applies to all mammals. Um, for example, we have a very accurate clock for elephants. You can give us a blood sample from the so-called African elephant or the Asian elephant and we get correlations 0 0.96, 0 0.97, 0 0.96. These clocks are of interest to people who um, um, want to conserve and uh, protect animals so they can monitor the ages of elephant population. But in the lower panels, I show you kind of a crazy thing, you know, so we built epigenetic clocks that um, apply both to elephants and humans at the same time. One mathematical formula, you give us a blood sample of a human, you give us one from elephants, we get correlations 0.97, you know, for this, uh, I call it human elephant clock. You know. Moving to cats. Um, again, we have very accurate clocks for cats. Um, these are blood samples from different cat uh, lines, cat breeds. And again, we can go through this exercise of trying to develop uh, dual species clocks that apply both to cats and their owners. So these human cat clocks. And here, I um, uh, the points are colored by species. Uh, uh, the orange are the human samples. And, um, but even if you apply this human cat clock just to cat samples, you know, this is in panel C, we get a correlation 0.97. So to me, this is kind of a, a powerful illustration that actually these, these processes that underlie epigenetic aging are highly conserved. You know, the fact that you can build a human cat clock, a human elephant clock, uh, really tells you something about conservation. Um, some people prefer uh, dogs over cats. So um, I want to mention we did a very detailed analysis in 51 different dog breeds. Again, we have a, a very accurate clock that applies to all dog breeds. And um, yeah, I, um, we, we, we have also lifespan predictors of dogs, but I'll present that another time. Um, the naked mole rat is, of course, one of the most fascinating animals uh, for aging researchers. So here I show you um, a collaboration with Vera Gorbunava, Chris Fox, and many others, where we uh, built an epigenetic clock for naked mole rat. And as you know, uh, the naked mole rat has a negligible senescence on, on a physiological or phenotypic level, but it's interesting, you can still build very accurate clocks. And in my worldview, this shows that the naked mole rat can really deal very effectively with the epigenetic damage that accumulates. Um, moving to another animal, rats, um, another rodent. Um, and we have here again, um, clocks that only apply to uh, various rat tissues, but we also have clocks that apply to humans and rats, so human rat clocks. Um, a major focus was on understanding bat species. Why? Because bats are fascinating animals. They, have this, they often um, have the same size of a mouse, <clears throat> but can live for over four, um, some um, bat species can live for more than 40 years. So what's the secret behind it? You know? 
So in collaboration with Jerry Wilkinson and a team of bat researchers, um, we developed um, highly accurate clocks for various bats here. But importantly, we developed a clock that uh, applies to all bat species. Um, you may know um, there are over 1,000 different bat species. They are highly divergent um, uh, on a uh, sequence level, but still one manages to build a single clock that really accurately applies to here 26 different bat species. By the way, any plot I show you is based on either cross-validation or a true test set. So I, it, I never show data from training sets, you know, because it's so misleading. Um, um, but what's the big prize? Um, can we build an epigenetic clock that really applies to all mammalian species? You know? um, I refer to such an epigenetic clock as a universal mammalian clock. And um, we are very much uh, working on that. Um, to, to address that, we have collected um, over 12,000 DNA samples from over 160 species and I want to show you one of the first uh, versions of this uh, universal clock. Um, so th this panel um, uses uh, 3,000 test set samples. And the dots are labeled and colored, uh, they are labeled by species. And here I show you on the right panel all the species. We have everything from human to cotton rabbit alpacas, um, I mentioned the bats, dogs, um, lions, um, elephants, and so on. And I, I think you can appreciate th these are very high correlations, you know. So um, I can already tell you, um, we have uh, and will publish a universal clock very soon. Um, um, now, moving to another topic, um, because these, when we talk about epigenetic aging clocks, um, it really refer to calendar age. But um, there are more interesting question. Um, why do similar species, um, such as mammals, have markedly different maximum lifespans? And um, there's, of course, a vast literature on that topic. Um, my angle is clearly methylation, as you can suspect. And here I want to show you um, the results for one cytosine. There's a single location in the genome. And for that location, the methylation levels on the x-axis are actually highly correlated with the uh, maximum longevity, maximum lifespan on the y-axis, correlation minus 0.64. You know? Now I highlight here one cytosine, but I could have given you several. You know? So, um, and this comes out, um, in, in essence, it's what people call an epigenome-wide association study, which cytosines correlate with maximum lifespan across species. And here I show you some results across the genome, and um, each dot is a genomic location. And uh, looking at the p-values that exceed uh, or uh, 10 to the minus 20, there are really many locations that associate that uh, strongly with maximum lifespan. And so um, a big picture methylation very much is informative of maximum lifespan across species. And this pertains to any way you would want to analyze the data. If we just focused on bat species, we would find cytosines. If you just focus on rodents, you would find it, you know, various ways of uh, um, um, stratifying the analysis. I now want to come to um, the human species because we all uh, like uh, that species uh, um, uh, short history. The first generation of epigenetic clocks uh, really focused, of course, on chronological age. For example, the pan tissue clock was a measure of chronologic age. It was exciting because it's one biomarker that applies to all sources of DNA, any cell type. Um, now, <clears throat> it's also well known that if you exhibit epigenetic age acceleration, meaning your methylation age estimate is higher than expected, then 
um, you have a slightly higher risk of various uh, uh, age-related conditions, including, of course, a, a mortality risk. However, the original first-generation clocks uh, show rather weak uh, predictive ability for lifespan. And that uh, stimulated then the research on developing the so-called second-generation epigenetic clocks. You know PhenoAge, you know GrimAge. PhenoAge was uh, developed by um, my former postdoc Morgan Levine, GrimAge by um, Ake Lu. And these um, clocks should really be thought of as mortality risk predictors, not as age estimators. And um, so, for example, if you are in the top 5% of fastest agers, according to Grim Age, your hazard of death is more than twice that of the average person. And this statement pertains to um, any uh, stratum that an epidemiologist would come up with. For example, you could, um, Grim Age is a wonderful predictor of lifespan in people who never smoked a single cigarette in their life. Conversely, it's also a great uh, lifespan predictor uh, in heavy smokers. It works in men, women, different ethnic groups, and so on. Um, here I show you one, of, one meta-analysis, but I could have found many others. So um, here we looked at people of Hispanic ancestry, African ancestry, uh, European ancestry, and you consistently find significant hazard ratios. And the hazard ratios look weak perhaps to you, uh, but mind you, it's associated with one year of age acceleration. Um, the hazard ratios would be well over two if we calculated eight years of age acceleration. You know? So 5% of the population have an age acceleration uh, larger than 7.5, I think, according to Grim Age. Now, what we and many others want to do is we want to qualify Grim Age or similar biomarkers as surrogate endpoint for human anti-aging studies. Um, why? Because um, we cannot wait for 30 years to validate an anti-aging intervention. We need surrogate endpoints. And um, so um, to convince us and others, including people from the FDA, you, you really need to assemble a large body of evidence. And including, um, above all, cross-sectional associations. So the good thing is there are a dozen papers by independent groups that validate GrimAge. No, nobody doubts that it predicts lifespan in a cross-sectional association study. But um, a more interesting question is really longitudinal studies. So let's say you have blood draws um, collected two times or three times, separated by five years. Does the rate of change in GrimAge um, portend bad outcomes? The answer is yes. You know? so, um, we, uh, I'll show you some data from the uh, normative aging study. We also assembled um, genetic evidence. Um, so polygenic risk scores for grim age are strongly associated with parental longevity. We just put a paper in bio archive. And then um, topic number four <clears throat> is um, to assess test retest variability. And why, um, if somebody draws your blood and tells you your grim age is hopefully 29, and then a day later you go to the lab and measure it again, I, hopefully it's still 29, you know? So <laughs> you want to make sure that there's low variability, you know? And again, um, grim age and similar biomarker look very good. So <clears throat> to briefly mention it, the rate of change in grim age is, it, associated with increased hazard of death. This uh, study was done by Alexandra Binder, and uh, she looked at uh, multiple blood draws from the normative aging study. Um, the paper is not yet uh, published, but just so that you know. Um, people who are interested in polygenic risk scores for grim age and other epigenetic clocks can access those. Um, our data are published on BioArchive, including the SNPs, so I invite you to look for that. 
Um, I mentioned um, these um, test retest studies. So we find very high intra-class correlations, well above 0.95 for GrimH across technical replicates. Um, the low values can be observed when you look at buckle swaps, you know. So um, the thing is, um, the GrimH biomarker doesn't apply to buckle swaps, you know. So forget about it. But for blood, it has exceptional uh, um, um, uh, intra-class correlation coefficients. Um, <clears throat> so epigenetic clocks are already being used in human clinical trials. So I'm very happy about it. and. Um, I mentioned this uh, very interesting study from Greg Fahey and uh, Bobby Brook, who um, developed a treatment for thymus regeneration. And interestingly, there was an important side effect of the treatment. Um, it ended up rejuvenating um, epigenetic clocks and actually several epigenetic clocks. Um, so here I show you the data, each panel is a different epigenetic clocks. The x-axis shows you a month from trial onset, so from baseline zero to 18 month. And I think you appreciate that the grim age clock um, shows uh, two and a half years of age reversal. Now, the problem with uh, the limitation of the study was that it was a phase one trial. Not, it was meant to sh uh, show safety, not efficacy, you know. And it, so it involved actually only nine uh, individuals. And, but I'm very happy that uh, Greg Fay and Bobby Brook will now uh, conduct an expanded trial. Um, it will probably commence in a month or so. And they um, as, uh, um, will enroll at least 85 people, hopefully more. And um, if we are lucky, we will um, have solid data uh, next year, you know. So uh, in conclusions, human clocks differ in predictive accuracy for mortality. Um, I hope I convinced you in my uh, mammalian studies that methylation very much uh, is associated with um, differences in maximum lifespan in species. I hope I convinced you that in humans, methylation is very much predictive of um, average life expectancy. You know? In other words, mortality risk even after you adjust for all the risk factors that an epidemiologist can think of from blood pressure, lipid levels, and so on. Um, if you plan these studies in your own uh, research, you want to carefully think about the source of DNA. For some anti-aging treatments, uh, for example, menopausal hormone therapy, and I would argue even rapamycin, I think buckle swaps would be far more informative than blood uh, draws. But for other um, um, anti-aging intervention, actually blood is far more informative, you know, so you need to think about it. And um, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Really fantastic talk. Um, we have a number of questions. Uh, I can see that, uh, so the most upvoted question is actually from myself. Um, so that's great. And thank you for the support out there. Uh, I'm wondering if there is conservation of methylation patterns across species with age, and what I was actually wanting to understand is whether or not the patterns in different species can tell us something about why they live longer or shorter. Yes. Um, the, the second part of the question can be easily addressed. So absolutely, uh, methylation gives you answers to why species live longer and shorter, you know. and um, you can imagine there are many different types of analyses you can do. You can do phylogenetic regression, you can look at, at rates of change, and um, I can tell you any way you analyze the data, you will find a huge signal for maximum lifespan. Um, uh, next time I can show you some exciting genes from these studies. You know. um, the, the earlier part of the question is conservation, you know. So, um, it, that's a very important question. It, and it depends to some extent on the measurement platform. So my custom array, which is known as a mammalian array, was designed so that it uh, maximizes the signal of conservation.
So it looks at cytosines in genomic locations that are highly conserved across mammals. And so if you use the mammalian array, things look very easy in terms of conservation by design, you know. <laughs> and um, having said this, um, if you build a clock in one species, um, let's say humans, then more often than not, it does not apply to another species. So the average human clock will not apply to dogs, you know. However, if you put in a little bit of work, it's actually easy to build a clock that applies to both species, you know. It's just that you need to build it a certain way, you know. But uh, most of the clocks that uh, we or others have published for humans will not directly be applicable to um, other species. Okay, thank you very much. And there's a related question from um, uh, Marco De Maria, who uh, asks, is there any mechanistic consequences for some of the most conserved methylation changes? Um, there's got to be, right? <laughs> but um, um, uh, this really needs to be very carefully studied, you know, by uh, many researchers. On the one hand, uh, one would want to study this in um, animal models, could be um, uh, the killifish or the um, uh, zebra fish, or of course, mice and rats, uh, genetic knockout studies and so on. But also, I'm a a big believer in uh, cell line studies, you know, so um, I, I think um, I wish more people were working on it. Um, uh, we have started working on that, you know, um, to look at various cellular phenotypes, but I'm, I'm not comfortable uh, with sharing results until I've convinced myself that I believe them, you know, so. Yeah. Interesting. And one last question then here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question from uh, Thomas Hansen. Thank you for presenting these interesting data. Do you believe the epigenetic changes are only correlating or also have a causal component in aging? And have you looked at any potential drug for reversing these epigenetic changes? Yes, so um, we very much look at drugs that reverse these changes. Uh, there are several um, um, exciting candidates, um, very exciting studies. Um, um, the question about correlation and causation um, has actually several answers. Um, let me um, back off and remind people that there are 28 million cytosines, or so called CPGs, in the human genome. And so you can easily imagine that many of the age related changes are just correlative noise. You know, they reflect changes in uh, cell composition you know, then the entropy, no consequences. Conversely, there will be locations where uh, age-related methylation changes do have a substantial effect, you know. On the one, uh, um, maybe on neighboring uh, uh, gene expression levels, but it could also, uh, there could also be distal effects. Um, and there are many very good hypotheses. So um, one is that um, these uh, methylation changes um, um, lead to loss of cellular identity um, in, in cells, you know. And um, the, the other insight is that these methylation changes um, could also uh, very much affect adult stem cells, you know. So um, th th there's very nice uh, evidence from human hematopoietic stem cells that shows that these methylation changes could have consequences, you know. Um, yeah. So the answer is yeah, both, you know. So some changes are truly causal, others are correlative. You know? Well, thank you very much, Steve. We sincerely appreciated your participation and we hope to see you next year in New York. And uh, uh, to you and all the other speakers, don't forget to go on the Slack channel and then you can answer the additional questions. You have many questions on the Slack, Steve. So there's uh, still a lot of work for you to do here. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you very much.